This is the story of uh, the settlement of Antigo and Langlade County as told by the Dilliglees family. The Dilliglees family's papers at the Langlade County Historical Society tell the personal as well as an era's experience of a larger phenomenon, the occupation and settlement of a major portion of a continent. Family documents dating back to the emigration of young Francis Delaglise with his family from Switzerland have been preserved by the family and donated to the Langlade County Historical Museum. They've been organized and cataloged by Lee Dinsmore and Joe Hermelin. This presentation will outline some aspects of the lives of these people and the impact they had on the surrounding community, told in their own words and those of their contemporaries. The whole story will deal with their immigration from Europe, Francis's participation in the Civil War, and then how the family moved into the Northwoods, the area around Antigo, and how they were involved in the establishment of the community of Antigo. The year 1848 was significant in many ways for the settlement of the U.S. There were poor harvests in Europe as well as political unrest and this led to mass migrations from Europe to America. At this time the U.S. was becoming industrialized and required labor on the East Coast and farmland was opening up uh, in the western regions of the country. Wisconsin was declared a state in 1848, thereby opening up new territory for settlement. That same year, 1848, was when Maurice de Leglise, the father, Catherine Lang, the mother, with their three children, Francis de, de Leglise, 13, Maurice, age one, and Marguerite, seven, left the Canton du Valais of Switzerland. Maurice had participated in the campaign of the Sonderband in 1846. This was a separatist association of seven Catholic cantons and was dispersed after a short civil war. Some of Maurice's correspondence back to his family in Switzerland have been preserved and cite a history of the region prepared in 1955. Maurice writes back to his relatives in Switzerland. My trip was very happy, but our money disappeared and we arrived here with seven dollars. The climate of the new world made us undergo four months of fever. We arrived here with almost nothing. We have undergone some hardship. A, a letter from the family in Switzerland addressed to Maurice uh, asks some questions of what it's like living in Wisconsin. Uh, they ask because they're thinking of emigrating as well. And they ask, what seeds would you advise a person to bring with him? Tell us yet, what are the chief products of the country? Whether there are ferocious animals, such as bears and wolves. Tell us whether the herds graze in the fields during all of the good season. Do the cows give as much milk as they do here? What is the culture of the tree you call sugar? What things do the savages most want? Does the government maintain garrisons in the region? Tell us about the rains and the storms in a land which is not sheltered by mountains. We know less about the Bohr family or Barr family, but in 1855, Simon Barr, his wife and daughter Mary, age 20, emigrated from Bohemia to Wisconsin, settling on land adjacent to the De Leglise track. Francis, also age 20 at the time, spoke French and English. Mary spoke Bohemian and German. Nonetheless, they were married within one year. 20th century photographs show the homes that the Delaglees and Bohr families left behind to settle in Wisconsin. Descendants in Europe vouch for the fact that these structures are very much the same as they were in the mid-19th century when the families left for America. By 1861, with the country on the brink of civil war, the Delaglise family, consisting of Francis and Mary and three children ranging in age from three and a half to six months, were happily settled in the Appleton area. With the civil war looming, 
Francis enlisted at Fond du Lac in 1861 and became part of the Iron Brigade, or Bragg's Rifles, Company E, 6th Wisconsin Infantry. Here we see the flag that the brigade carried into battle, and uh, in it is embroidered the names of the battles that they fought in. Francis was wounded three times at the battles of Antietam and Gettysburg. He was taken as a prisoner of war, but soon released. He wrote back to his relatives in Switzerland and described in detail his role in several battles. At one point, while recuperating from wounds in Newark, he took the opportunity to visit New York City. And in a letter he writes, The streets are paved, which is a rarity in America. The magnificent farms are destroyed in order to make place for wooden buildings. Then these structures, which are still as good as new, are destroyed to make place for stores built of brick and covered with sheets of iron to preserve them against fire. Then these brick buildings, although also in good condition, are also destroyed to make room for edifices of granite, white marble, or iron. After the war, his wounds required a further year of recuperation in Madison's Harvey Hospital, where he notes in his diary, Dr. Culbertson took the ball out after having been 11 months, 6 days, and 20 hours in my side. The, his discharge papers from the war are shown here, signed by Dr. Culbertson, the doctor who tended to him in Madison. For almost six years, his wife was the breadwinner and manager of the household. Francis could send her little money. While recuperating in Madison in 1864, he wrote, I expected, or rather was confident, to receive my full back monthly pay, but contrary to my expectation, I was paid but for the month of May and June, $36. I send you $10 within the current letter, and I will send you $20 more. Francis was a finally officially discharged from Madison and went back home to Appleton. After the war and his recuperation, Francis Dillaglees became a timber cruiser. This involved exploring an area and studying the forests for the types and sizes of trees with the thought of how useful it would be for logging. When he came to this area in 1870s, he did not enter a total wilderness devoid of human activity. White settlements existed around Green Bay and along the Fox River in western Wisconsin. The only white settlement in north central Wisconsin was in Wausau. However, Indians, primarily Ojibwe and Menominees, populated this area. They had established villages and hunting and harvesting society. In addition, fur traders, mostly French, and missionaries explored the area. The woods in this region were quite dense with various types of trees. A periodical called the Industrial West promoted the region in an 1887 issue. They state, the country is heavily timbered with basswood, maple, birch, and rock elm, which are the pr principal timbers. There are also pieces of choice oak, ash, cherry, and butternut. One can get a sense of these early forests in this drawing and also in a recent satellite photograph of the Menominee Reservation. Here you see from space that the dense forests of the Menominee Reservation where selective harvesting is done uh, can still be visible as a dark green. Up in the upper left hand corner of the uh, satellite photo is the beginning of the Antigo Flats. At this time, when Francis was, Delaglise was exploring the area, the only white settlement in the area was that of Willard L. Ackley, a native of New York who, in 1857, had established a trading post on the forks of the east and west branches of the Eau Claire River. Sophie, one of um, Francis and Mary Delaglise's children, wrote of Ackley. He married a Chippewa woman, a widow with a son and one daughter. She was very hospitable, 
capable and always ready to serve in time of sickness. Francis de Leglise made the Ackley home his headquarters, where he was always welcome. It was while Francis was a timber cruiser that he began to think of the region on the banks of Springbrook as a central point of a town. He wrote how he and his partner, Solomon Farringer, established a camp on the west bank of the Springbrook River, and he stated, At that time, not even a stick of timber had ever been cut in that vicinity by white men, except by U.S. surveyors in 1860, some hunters or trappers or cruisers like myself. With the exception of a few pieces, all of this tract of land was then held by the state and was on the market for a dollar and a quarter an acre. He, he purchased the land around the point which is now the intersection of Fifth Avenue and Superior Street in his wife's name using money from an inheritance of hers. He sold lots to George Eckert, a f uh, relative of his wife's, and to his son-in-law, John Derrish. By December 1876, John Derrish had cleared about an acre of land and erected a small log cabin about one and a half miles to the west of Francis's claim. They cleared a trail from the Ackley home to their claims. This trail is now Fifth Avenue. John Derrish then went back to Appleton to bring his 19-year-old bride, Mary Teresa, the eldest daughter of Francis and Mary de la Glise. They also brought with them Mary's younger sister, Anna, age 10, and she stayed the winter with her sister and brother-in-law. Years later, Anna would write of her older sister's first days in this area. During her four weeks' stay here at Ackley's, Mrs. Derrish was initiated into the arts of the natives by Mrs. Ackley. She learned to tan deerskin and to make moccasins and even how to bead them. She was also taught what roots were good and what their uses were. The other area around the Civil War, uh, prior to the Civil War, was the old military raid, uh, trail running north of Antigo, and it was used as a trail for transporting troops. It later became a major artery for the lumber industry, primarily around the Wolf River. John and Mary Derrish, who were living in this in the cabin just west of the De La Glise claim, lived there for a year, and here is um, a sketch of their cabin as done by Anna De La Glise, the younger sister who was living with them at the time. Anna also recalls her life in this cabin. For playmates, I had only the squirrels, chipmunks, and sparrows, and numerous weasels to keep one interested, with an occasional porcupine for excitement. I did want to push back the woods and navigate, but was not supposed to venture beyond a little clearing, only a couple of acres full of stumps and brush piles, and logs laying everywhere. The day came when I did follow the trodden trail of the Weekses as far as where the trail to Baker's forked off and was surprised breathless to see a big bearded man holding a little girl about my own age by the hand and smiling to greet me, the first child I had ever seen. It was Mr. Frank Burns bringing his family to Homestead. Then in the spring of 1878, work started in earnest to establish the Dillaglee's home. The cabin was built by Mr. Eckhart and John Derrish. Another of the Dillaglee's daughters, uh, Sophie, years later recalled move, the move of the rest of the family from Appleton to their new cabin. John Derrish came with a team of horses to move the family and the first Tuesday of March, 1878, the start was made for Springbrook. Mr. Dillaglee's was to follow the next morning, leading two cows and a heifer. The first evening they made about five miles. There they joined Joseph Sheriff and Thomas McCann. The next morning, three teams, nine grown-ups and three children, started toward the north. They had to cross the Wolf River on a pontoon bridge. It looked very much as if Mr. McCann's team 
loaded and all, would go down into the river. They were nearly across when one of the loose planks tipped and let the horses down. Fortunately, it was the noon hour, and the hotel just at the top of the hill and the boarders sitting outside witnessed the accident. Very soon, there was an army of men unhitching and pulling the horses out, straightening out the plank, hitching up one of the other teams onto the load and pulling it up the hill. Altogether, the trip from Appleton to the cabin on the banks of Springbrook took five days. The home that they moved into was not yet complete, still without doors and windows. At one end stood the cooking stove, broken during the journey, and the dining table. At the other end, in one corner, was a two-tiered bunk, and in the other corner, a bedstead. This part was curtained off by a carpet. The home served the needs of the family of two adults and six children and stood where Superior Street and Fifth Avenue are now. In 1914, residents decided to preserve this part of their history and had the building moved to its current location on the grounds of what was then the city's public library. Antigo seems to be have been ahead of its time in their sense of historic preservation. The cabin as it existed in its original location is shown in the top photograph and in the bottom you can see the cabin on rollers being moved down Superior Street to its location at the library, now the museum. Here are some views of the interior of the cabin. This dress chest of drawers was used uh, to hold mass for the growing city of, of Antigo before they had a church established. The cooking stove in the dining room, which was added on a year or so after the original cabin was erected and the family had moved in. In 1878, the small settlement consisted of three families, 18 people. The Dillaglee's home would serve as a stopover for many travelers that summer, and Francis had supplies brought in from Wausau for his own family and for new settlements, new settlers. Within a year, Niels Anderson set up the first store in the area on land given to him by Francis Dillaglee's. Several families had come to settle in the area known as Springbrook. They were enticed by the prospects of the lumber industry, farming, and offers of land. Farmers would clear the land and use the proceeds from the timber sales to pay off the debts incurred in land purchases. In the 20 or so years prior to this, the growth of the lumber industry was in areas closer to the larger rivers, like the Wolf where loggers could float logs down to sawmills. The area around Antigo was generally ignored as it was considered too expensive to get timber to market. But some astute businessmen could foresee the use of rail. In 1879 and 1880, a railroad line was planned to go within two miles of Antigo. Francis induced the builders to come through the town with a gift of eight blocks of land. In 1881, the rail line was complete. Within two years, the population went from 100 to 500. By 1884, the population reached 1,300. By 1885, Antigo was incorporated as a city. The uh, survey crew that Francis Dillaglees used to map out, to plat out the city of Antigo is shown here. His brother Lawrence Dillaglees was part of that surveying crew. Some of Francis Dillaglees' surveying tools are still on display at the museum. And some of his surveyor's notebooks are very interesting to uh, 
to read for their description of what sorts of trees and what sort of terrain was in what areas. These again are all in the museum. As the community grew, so did its political clout. Shano and the town of Langlade on the Wolf River had been larger centers of political power and little effort was made to improve the lot of citizens around Antigo. In the spring of 1879, the residents of Antigo uh, devised a plan to overthrow the town board of Langlade and replace it with one more sympathetic to the people of Antigo. At this time, Francis de la was, was part of the group that tried to make Antigo, to gain more political clout for Antigo. It, at this time, the area of north central Wisconsin had its name changed from New County to Langlade County in honor of Charles de Langlade, a leader of the French and Indian Wars. Also in 1880, the county board meetings a county board meeting changed the name of Springbrook to Antigo from the Native American word Nequi Antigo Sihe, meaning a group of evergreens with a stream running through it. During the next few years, from 1881 to 1885, the boundaries of Langlade, Shano, and Oconto counties were often revised and Forest County established out of the northern portion of Langlade County. Francis de la Glise, who was not only a pioneer resident of the region, was also a major businessman, and one of his important businesses was real estate development. Together with various partners, he plotted and platted and sold land through the real estate business. His survey crew included his brother, Lawrence. His first real estate partner was W. W. Hutchinson, Together they published this pamphlet, a promotional booklet extolling the virtues of the area. The booklet itself generated a great deal of interest, as did, other, as did other notices in various periodicals. And the booklet promotes the area by telling you that there are no floods, no blizzards, and no cyclones in the area. In the inside of the book, there are claims that this is the place to move to because the soil is wonderfully fertile. The water cannot be excelled for purity. The timber is magnificent. The markets are steadiest and surest. The society is the best in the West. Occupations are multitude. Recreation can be taken with pleasure and profit. Investments are safe and profitable. This booklet received a great deal of response from all over the country with people wanting to know more about Antigo and how they could come to move here. Meanwhile, the Diligles family continued to prosper and grow um, with the sale of this land and the development of the town. Here we see Francis Diligles and Mary Diligles as prominent citizens of Antigo. Altogether, they had nine children, not all of whom uh, survived to adulthood. Mary Teresa Delegles, the eldest, married John Derrish at the same time that the whole family moved here. Sophie and Anna were, became prominent members of the community, and two brothers, Adelbert, also known as Albert, and Alexi, or Alex, also became prominent citizens in the community. Here are the five children of the Diligleses that, that survived to adulthood and who became prominent members of the community. Mary, the eldest, is on the left. Anna wrote many letters, and thanks to that, we have a sense of what life was like for the Dulleglees family. At one point, she was at, away at boarding school in Dubuque, and she wrote home with a concern for her brother. She, spoke, she wrote to her father, Papa, sometimes 
when you go to inspect something, send for Alex and let him accompany you. Alex will be the better for it, for while he lives on what Antigo has to offer in the way of satisfying his better nature, he cannot but be discontented and discouraged as a young man who finally concludes life is not worth living. Papa, do let him see what is great in the world and do not let him rot in Antigo. So obviously she was not too pleased with life in Antigo. But in spite of all these negative feelings about Antigo she, and liking Dubuque so much, she did return to Antigo to help in the family business. There she met a young man, Tom Morrissey, who was a farm implement dealer and realtor. Tom and Anna married and raised a family in Antigo, two boys and two girls. Her letters of motherly advice to her children while they were away at boarding school are in the museum and reveal some of her thoughts. She wrote to one daughter who was at the time about 14 years old. I know you were glad to see the Ladies Home Journal, the Christmas fashion number, and so many pretty Christmas ideas. As the magazine number that one article of the New York Girls has seen and heard in Gay New York is written simply to show what lengths a very proper person can be driven in New York and to warn girls of the dangers to them in such a city. I think, dear, for a young girl like you, it would be best not to read that article, or if you should already have done so, just take and cut the pages out so none of the other girls might happen to read it. Another sister, Sophie, married Sam Leslie and also continued to stay in Antigo, raise a family, and took part in the family business. Adelbert, or sometimes known as Albert, was the black sheep in the family. Uh, and many uh, interesting events in his life are recorded in letters at the museum. At 18, he ran away from home and wrote back to his parents. I am going to Boston or New York, and from one of those places take a steamer, the first one I can find, for either Australia or Africa. On the whole, I am much happier now than I was, and by my reckoning will remain so. I occasionally meet with an old gentleman who has traveled a little and get up a conversation with him that sometimes lasts two or three hours. Travelers generally like to rate, relate their experiences, and I like to meet with them. Adelbert did see the world by joining the Navy. He wrote home frequently, describing his experiences in France and in various Mediterranean ports. Later, while stationed in South America, he described how a mutiny in Chile was uh, put down by the Chilean government. Some sailors on his ship were, uh, were granted shore leave. Chile, Chilean citizens, angered over the perceived involvement of the U.S. in their local affairs, thinking that they were involved in the mutiny, attacked the group, leaving two sailors dead. Uh, Adelbert, thankfully, was not granted shore leave, and he stayed uh, safely on board. In spite of his wish to leave Antigo, Adelbert did not completely cut his ties to the family in Antigo. His father, Francis, visited him while he was stationed in Boston and wrote home in terms that indicated how proud he was of his son. Adelbert eventually moved back to Antigo in 1892, but didn't stay long and moved on to Minneapolis. Even in the best of families, some feuds do occur, and the one in the Dilligley's family eventually wound up in the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. After Francis's death in 1894, his widow Mary continued as the nominal head of the business. There, 
Her two daughters, Mrs. Anna Morrissey and Mrs. Sophie Leslie, handled the estate with Mary Deliglis acting as the administrator. During this time, Anna Morrissey attempted to divide part of the state among some of the children. In subsequent years, other children took over the business, Adelbert and Alexi. Mary Deliglis did not participate in the daily running of the business, but remained active in various civic and church affairs. In her attempts to become more aware of the business, she was helped by some children while others conspired to withhold information from her. These issues, as well as attempts to have her declared mentally incompetent, led to legal disputes which continued up to her death in 1907, and the validity of her will was disputed. Basically, Anna and Sophie were on one side, and the two boys, Alexei and Adelbert, were on the other side. Anna wrote, testified during the trial. Father tried to get him interested in the business, but he could do nothing. He could do. He couldn't do anything with him. Then he just laid around and didn't do anything. Not even bring in a stick of wood. The dispute was eventually resolved in favor of the older will, favoring Anna and Sophie. Members of the Deliglis family were all devout Catholics and played a major role in the development of the church in Antigo. For the first three years of its existence, the settlement was without a priest. The nearest parish was in Wausau, a journey of several days. One priest, Reverend Philip St. Louis from Menasha, visited some families in the area around what is now Phlox in 1879 and hearing of this settlement, arranged to return in a year. At Easter time in 1880, he continued by train to Clintonville, which was then the end of the line, then hired a team of horses and came first for two days in flocks and then on to Springbrook. On May 2nd, 1880, the first mass was held in this area in the home of the Dillaglis family. All household furniture was removed benches improvised, and a large bureau served as an altar. The Lagliese home continued to serve as a temporary church for two more years, with Father St. Louis journeying from flocks to conduct services. He often came on foot. When the congregation reached about 50 families, the Lagliese home was no longer sufficient, and services were held at various other locations, often at the Dulleglis real estate office. By 1882, a frame building, 25 feet by 60 feet, was erected as a church on land donated by Mrs. Mary Dulleglis. The church did not stand long. It was destroyed by fire in 1883. The community immediately began to plan for a new building, but there was some dispute as to where it should be located. A large Gothic church was agreed upon and it was erected in the same location. Francis de Liglise served on the building committee and the family donated a major portion of the funds required for construction. They also worked on fund drives. Construction began in 1884 and when the building was not yet completed in 1887 an additional fund drive, fund drive was arranged with a raffle of three city lots, prizes donated by Mary de Liglise. In 1887, services began to be held in the new church. This is St. John's Church, um, as it appeared in 1907. The building was eventually extensively remodeled, same location as the original church. When, in 1894, the com Polish community in Antigo wished to organize their own congregation, St. Hyacinth's Parish, the Dulleglis family contributed generously. In 1897, a, bo a Bohemian church was erected in Neva, this is St. Wenzel's, but it was too distant for Antigo's Bohemian community, and Mary Dulleglis 
donated more land and money to establish a Bohemian church in Antigo. This was St. Mary's, ele erected in 1901. By Anna Morrissey's re reckoning, the Catholic community in the area grew from about 50 families in 1883 to well over 200 10 years later, with 80 Irish or English families, 70 German families, 45 Polish families, 25 Bohemian families, and a few Belgians, French, and Dutch. A number of members of the Dulleglis family served in the forces in World War I. Cyril Leslie, a son of, Mayor of um, a son of Sophie Leslie, served in the 107th Trench Mortar Battery Company, a company formed from by recruits from the area. While in, while in training in Texas, he wrote to his aunt, Ann Morrissey, complaining about the heat and describing his training routine. He also complained about the near beer, which he thought only resembled beer by being in similar glass bottles. He also enjoyed going to town on leave and meeting with the local women. I wonder how Anna, who was so stern in her advice to her own children, received these letters from her nephew. He eventually went overseas with the 107th Trench Mortar Battery Company and saw action in Belgium and France. To his mother, Sophie, Cyril wrote from somewhere in France, as it says on this postcard, about his trip over. He states that when we got to the harbor, the people would come up in little boats about the size of tubes, and the fellows would throw tobacco, cigarettes, and money in their boats. All the houses are built of stone. There isn't any house of wood. The people are all healthy looking with short and short with red faces. Some of them talk pretty good English. I mean, they, I mean what they say you can understand. While we are marching to camp, some of the little boys with wooden shoes would march along the sidewalk and they would count in English to keep us in step. He wrote in this postcard, Here, today was my wash day and we had a great time. We wash in a spring right at the edge of the camp and the French women were showing us how to wash. After the war, the 107th Trench Mortar Battery Company was honored in a parade in Antigo as they came home. But Cyril, who was either wounded or took ill, missed the parade. In December 1918, he telegraphed his mother from Camp Grant Hill in Illinois that he is out of the hospital and coming home. This is a telegram from Cyril saying that he's finally released and on his way home. Even as the war was winding down, new concerns arose. The influenza pandemic and was uh, raging in the United States. One, uh, one of Anna's sons was in the Navy aboard ship. Another son was in training in Madison. One daughter was at a convent school in Rochester, Minnesota, and the youngest daughter stayed home in Antigo. The letters reveal the concern of the entire family. Virginia, writing about life in Minnesota, says, has everything been closed up at home? Noticed a message from Madison that everything was closed there. How does that affect John? They aren't going to open the university here for some time yet. All the sisters have been inoculated, but I'm still thinking about it. School is going all right, only there are so many absent that I'm afraid that we will have to go over the work a second time when they get back. Anna describes conditions in Antigo. We are all keeping well. Our, all our families are up to date, but there is a quite considerable number of our population having it. In so many of the cases, whole families, and it is 
so hard to get nurses. The sisters volunteered their services and were out caring for one family all day yesterday and stayed all night. We went over to the Fitzgeralds last evening and the phone kept her busy most of the time about the nurses, etc. Papa has gone down to meet Claire and other members of this board to see if they cannot arrange to have the domestic service department of the high school start up and the teachers and girls do cooking of soups, etc., for the stricken needy, and those who cannot get nurses and families are all down. In 1928, Antigo celebrated its 50th anniversary. The centerpiece of the event was a parade down Fifth Avenue, including some members who were founders of the village, and a monument directed, uh, erected in honor of Francis de l'Eglise. This is only fitting in acknowledgement of his contribution to establishing this community. Ironically, in 1978, at the hundredth anniversary of the founding of Antigo, De La Glees was honored by having the De La Glees cabin put on a can of point beer. This is ironic because Francis De La Glees was very much opposed to alcohol and fought very hard to keep the city dry. Much of the material on this, in this uh, presentation is uh, taken from the family correspondence and the accounts of the Dilligley's family. We have all of this at the museum and they make very interesting reading. 